Psalm 116, the Bible reads, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell get hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low when he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believe, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, All men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am thy servant. I am thy servant and the son of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem. Praise ye the Lord. Uh, Brother Aaron, would you pray for us? Yeah, All right, Psalms 116, we're looking at this. There are seasons of prayer that we're going to find in our Christian life. There's times we're going to find, first of all, the Bible tells us that men are always to pray, not faint, right? We're always supposed to lift up holy hands and pray, and praise. Not just pray, not just pray, but also praise. And we ought to find that every time we turn around. Um, one of the things I told you a couple weeks ago, things I learned most about Pastor Carpenter growing up was, he can take any bad situation and make it a time to pray. And I'm not talking about Pollyanna type thing where I always look for the good in everything. It's the glad game. And, I'm, and I don't think we need to have that kind of pseudo-Christianity that we just make things up. But I think it ought to come from our heart. You know, even Paul took time in his persecution, his affliction. He took time and learned to pray and sing praises to God. But it says here in verse number, uh, Psalms 116 verses 1 through 19, but especially, I'm going to limit down here in verses 1 and 2 of seasons of prayer. And it says this, I love the Lord. Why do we love the Lord? Well, yes, because he first loved us. But because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. So he, we love the Lord because he heard our prayer. And, you know, I, I love the Lord for many reasons. I love that he's good. I love that he's holy. I love that he's just. I do love him for first loving me. But I can also say, I love the Lord because he does hear my voice, and he hears the voice of my supplications. It says in verse 2, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. I love the Lord because he listens to me. He just doesn't hear my voice and just, okay, forget about it. He hears my voice, and he, he listens to my voice, and he hears it, right? Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. There's things, you know... We have this sometimes with the girls, like, hey, well, hey, Sydney, do such and such. And then nothing goes on. And then you ask her, did you hear me? Yes. Okay, you listen. You heard what I had to say, but did you actually listen to me? Did you actually, are you following through what, what I've asked you to do? Or is it just kind of in one ear and out the other? Aren't you glad with God that he pays attention to us? Even when we don't pay attention to him sometimes. I mean, how many times have we read a scripture or we've read the scripture, or we've re heard it read or preached about, and maybe around the 17th time it's been read or preached or spoken, and it's like, oh, wait a second, that's something new. Whoa! That's something totally new in the Bible. I've discovered the new thing, you know? Like, I'm still trying to find out where, you know, New York is supposed to be destroyed by a nuclear attack on September 11th, and it didn't happen. But people can go back and mark my words. 
But how many times can we hear something new from Scripture, and it goes in one ear and out the other, but then the one time that it does actually stick in our ears, it's like, whoa, the coolest thing in the world, right? Do you realize that there's never a time that God doesn't listen to those who love him? There's never a time that those who are, are in, by the way, if you regard iniquity in your heart, you are choosing that iniquity over God and you no longer love God. Are you saved? Sure. But if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord does not hear me. If I choose, if I turn a deaf ear to the word of God, my prayer is ineffective. We can't get around that from Scripture. I can't, I can't get around that. But I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, because he hath inclined his ear to me. I love that in the middle of all the hubbub and all the nonsense going around, God tells us, especially in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14, the revival verse, right? If my people, which are called by my name, and shall seek my face, right? Then he says, well, he says, my ear is turned now to the earth. He says, I'm, I'm bowing my ear to the earth. It says that in verse 15. He says, I'm listening. I'm listening for you to start praying. I'm listening for that. But there are seasons for us as Christians to actually pray. But he says, I will therefore like call upon him as long as I live, and God will answer as long as, as, long as we live. Psalm 7, 7, we, read, we know this passage, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. It's a promise given. If we pray, he'll hear us. Luke chapter number 11, verse 9. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So there's times that we can go to the word of God in seasons, and we know that whatever season we are in life, that God wants to hear us pray. There's a song that Greater Vision, the Southern Gospel Group, sings, God wants to hear you sing. It's an amazing song. I love the song. I think it's fantastic. But, you know, God wants to hear you sing when the waves are crashing around you, when the fiery doubts surround you, when despair is all you see. God wants to hear your voice when the wisest man has spoken. and said your circumstances, your circumstances as hopeless as can be. That's when God wants to hear you sing. But you know what? It's a great song, but God wants to hear you pray. God wants to hear you call out to him in this time of calamity. God doesn't want you to bear your burden alone. God doesn't want to see how strong you are, to see if you are like a tea bag and the, you know, the, the, the hotter the water, the more stronger you are. God doesn't want the Christianese, you know, tea bag Christianity. God wants us to be sincere in what we are. There's nine times that we can look at through Scripture. There's nine times that we can find through Scripture and seasons that we go through in our life that God wants to hear from us. Let's dive into them. Number one, James chapter 5, verse 13. James chapter 5, verse 13. We ought to pray when we are afflicted and worried. When we are afflicted and worried. Is any among you afflicted? Let him tweet. <laughs> Is any afflicted among you? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. That's what God wants. If you're merry, sing psalms. If you're afflicted, let him pray. Psalms 34, 18. The Lord is nigh to them that are of a broken heart, and save of such as be of a contrite spirit. When you're worried, when you're anxious, be careful for nothing, right? Be careful for nothing, but let your requests be made known unto God. Psalms, what? Psalms 4, 6. I butchered the verse. But... Let everything by prayer and thanksgiving be, you know, your request be made known to God. Don't hold them back. If when you're when you're anxious or upset about something, let it go to God. When you're happy about something, when you're when you're afflicted, when you're just being torn, the world is tearing you up, circumstances have got you on the rails, you're not sure how you're gonna get past this roadblock you're in, and you're just afflicted. Maybe, maybe sickness, maybe ailments, maybe the curse of the world, maybe whatever it is. Is there any one of you afflicted? Let him pray. Let the church help pray for you. We'll get to that in a little bit too. But when you're afflicted, when you're worried, turn to God. It's easy preaching. It's hard living, right? Number two, when you have anger and wrath. That point took one and a half minutes. When you have anger and wrath. Now look, at the Bible tells us that we're not supposed to, we're not supposed to give place to wrath, right? The Bible says we're supposed to be the angry and sin not, but not to let our anger go unchecked, make sure we're living ourselves in balance. 
But in Ephesians chapter 4, in verse number 26, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Romans chapter 12, verse 19, the Bible says, Dearly beloved, avenge not your say, uh, your sales, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Giving that to God and turning over the anger and the wrath and the frustration to God. We read the imprecatory prayer, right? Impre impre Did I say that right? Imprecatory prayer? In Psalms 109, we always say, Oh, this is a prayer for Clinton. Oh, this is a prayer for Biden. Oh, this is a prayer for Obama. It's, oh, no, someone else. It's some other person. But he says, hey, let his days be few. Let another take his office. Let the extortioner catch all that he hath. These are prayers that we're actually praying, Lord, Lord, put him to death. In our wrath and our anger, we're actually turning our wrath and anger over to the Lord, saying, Lord, you deal with him. And that, for that it's a prayer in the fact that we're not actually praying a curse. We're asking God to go ahead and take him out. There's nothing wrong with those things. There's nothing wrong with having that prayer whatsoever. But as long as we're not doing it with anger, with sin, praying in anger is is okay as long as we're not sinning. Be angry and sin not. When you have wrath built up in you, that's another issue too. When you have this wrath and people are just constantly, wrath is unchecked. But it's easy for us to go into anger and just kind of get frustrated. Traffic is annoying, right? But how many times have we turned into wrath where we just want to let someone just let them have it? Like, you know what? I like Aaron and Sarah posted this past week on Instagram. They're talking about like, you know, what would Jesus do? You know, making a scourge and cleaning out the temple is not without, you know, not within, you know, out of its out of Christ's character. And what? But what do you do with it? What do you do with the wrath when it's unchecked? Anger is our emotion, but wrath is our decision. That was deep. That was good. Let me try that again. Anger is our emotion, but wrath is our decision. What we decide to do with our anger, that's that's wrath. What we decide to do, that's what we choose to pour out. God is angry with the wicked all day long, but he holds up his wrath until the time appointed. Right? So God in his wrath will take vengeance. God in his wrath, we see that in Nahum chapter 1. God is a God of wrath. He will take vengeance, and God's cup is full. His, it's filling up. But when we pray and when we have anger, we have wrath, make sure we give it to the Lord and hold back our holding back ourselves. Number three, we ought to pray when we need answers to why, as to why. Why, God? Why? You know, sometimes we ask God, God, why did you let this happen? And it's not a lot of times we're questioning God, like, how dare you do this to me? It's really, God, what have I done? Joshua, at, you know, chapter seven, Joshua is on his face before God. God, why? What happened? Why? Why did you let us get defeated at Jericho? You know, at Ai, you you let us defeat Jericho, and now all these people are going to laugh at us. We couldn't defeat a little army. We defeated Great Jericho. We couldn't defeat little Ai. Lord, what gives? What's up, Lord? What? What's up? What's going on here? Like, what did you? What did we do? Well, what? And God says, "Hey, get off your get get off your face. They're sinning again, right?" But going and asking God why it's not challenging God's. It's not challenging God's. Uh, ability to be God. You know, the girls will ask me a lot of times, hey, Dad, where are we going? Does it matter? But, Dad, where are we going? Well, well why? What, what are you doing? What, they need to know because they can't do it without it. It's not because they're, that's not because out of, it's, a lot of times it's not out of lack of faith, it's because they just, they need to know everything. And then sometimes they challenge your authority, but why? Why do we do that? Because I said so. One's inquisitive, one's challenging, and there's, or inqui inquisitive inquisitive and one's just kind of like you know interrogation like what are you doing well why why how dare you send me the bed you know and sometimes we do the same thing with god psalms 42 verse 9 psalms 42 verse I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I a mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? It's not wrong to ask God why. Here David's asking God, hey God, why? 
Well, why have you forgotten? Why, why am I going a morning, though, all because of the oppression of the enemy? Like, well, where are you at, God? You know, Mary, Mary and Martha come to God and come to Christ and say, hey, if you were here, my brother would not have died. Where were you? Like, excuse me, where were you, young man? The streetlights are on, why aren't you home? They're just asking God, if you were here, my brother had not have died. Where, where were you? God, where, I needed you in the time of trouble, you know? It was in the darkest time of my life, and I see footprints in the sand, and God, I just want to know where you're at. You know, footprints in the sand. Seriously, I don't know if I've ever read that to you guys or not, but go home this week and look at Butt Prints in the Sand. Right? It's, that's a poem called Butt Prints in the Sand. And I think it's an awesome, good lesson to learn. I think it's, I've said it before. i got to print it off sometime and put it in the church. But Seriously, it's great stuff. But it's, it's, it's not wrong sometimes to question God, saying, God, where were you? Like, what's up? Have I failed you? Am I, am I, am I in sin? Lord, what is it that I've done so wrong? Like, what is going on? God, where were you at in my life? The time I needed you most, where are you? Even Jesus said it. Even Jesus asked God, the Father, saying the same thing, right? Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, and also Mark 15, 34. He said it twice now, guys. <laughs> it's a little bit of a joke. <laughs> Jesus died on the cross once, right? But it's the same account from different stories. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, Lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God, why have you forsaken me? Even Jesus asked God that same question. Was it sinful to do that? In the time of trouble, God, why have you forsaken me? So when you need to answer is why, God, why has this happened? Sometimes we're asking God literally like, Lord, give me understanding. We're not always challenging, Lord, why thou, you know, we're not asking, the, the clay is not asking the potter, why hast thou made me thus? We're asking God, God, why? What, what, is it, what is it you've got for me here? What is it you're trying to teach me? Number four, when you need assurance of his working. When you need assurance of his working. In Matthew chapter number 11, we see John the Baptist questioning Christ. Not questioning him, challenging him, but Lord, are you sure? Lord, is this, I don't understand your timing. God, what are you doing? I, I need to know that you're working here. I need to know that what you're doing is, is what I've said. You know, I need to know that my life is not in vain. I need to know that I'm seeing, I'm, I'm going to see the salvation of Israel. I want to make sure I'm seeing what I'm seeing here. Matthew chapter 11, verse 1 through 6. And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his, the 12 disciples, his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in other their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Hey, are you really the Christ, or should I look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. Hey, go and tell John the things that you're seeing and hearing about. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Hey, you need some assurance, John? This is what we're doing. Sometimes, as churches, we have, like, we have, you know, especially with, like, we support missionaries or something, and we want to go in here, like, and get what's going on? Like, give me some feedback, what's going on in, in, in your field, you know? Give us an update. And it's like, oh, well... COVID's really bad here. I don't know how it is in America, but COVID's really bad over here. And well, we just can't get out doing any soul winning. So what we've been doing is just been trying to do things on social media. Really, what is it? Well, what we've been doing is we've been liking comments and commenting the gospel on people's comments. And we've been uh, involved with uh, forum or questions or articles and debate and such on Craigslist. And, you know, it's kind of hard because, you know, it's, you can't go out so winning and you can't have social distancing and there's curfew and they won't let you buy anything unless you've had the, you know, the jab. So uh, we really haven't gone so winning much outside the doors, you know, outside of, you know, on the streets or. But you know, I did tell the mailman the other day, God bless. Well, that's not exactly assurance. <laughs> you know, when you we, we went to hear back from a missionary, like, hey, what's been going on? Tell me how many so, you know, have you given the gospel out? How many souls have gotten saved? Um, have you been able to preach the gospel? 
Have you, you know, any, any responses to, so, to the sermons? Are, are people growing in the Lord? Is there any, you know, are the in, in your offerings getting better? We don't need to be on support full time. Like, what's going on? Sometimes people want to hear those updates. And if all you hear is, well, um, well, he's out there doing the work, I'm sure. I mean, he's got an ordination from, you know, he's been ordained by God to preach the gospel. And, I mean, he's got some people working with him. But, yeah, it's, I don't really know much about what Jesus is doing. And John's asking, hey, are you here? Or should I seek for another? Like, I need some assurance that I'm, I've backed the right guy here. I want to make sure I'm doing right here. I want to know you're doing the timetable, you're doing your due diligence. And Jesus says, hey, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the, de and the dead are raised up. That's exactly pretty much where everybody wants to stop at. Social gospel, right? Then I'm into hospital visits, I got a food pantry going, here I go in the food pantry again. Uh, I've helped with, you know, education, dyslexia education, or I've helped with, you know, people helping people learn to read. I've got a daycare in my church. Really awesome. Pretty cool. Um, we've got an AA, RU, OPQ, you know, OPQ, RST, Weight Watchers, Zumba. We're doing everything we can. Low esteem, self, low, low, low esteem, low self-esteem help group meets in the back doors at, at night. Um, this, you know, we, we got some really good opportunities to help out the people around us. And that's where people's ministry stop, especially with COVID. That's where ministry stop. But he says this, the poor have the gospel preached unto them. Has the gospel preached to them? He says, you know what? I'm preaching the gospel. I'm doing all these things, but I'm also preaching the gospel. All these things that I'm doing, and I'm preaching the gospel. And blessed is, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. But sometimes we need to go to the Lord and say, God, I just need to see you working. God, what are you, what are you doing in my life? So <clears throat> I was at a quilt show this past week. And I was watching, there's actually, there's a table in the, over in the corner, and some ladies were over there, some Amish ladies, and they're actually hand-stitching a quilt by hand, duh, in the corner, and they're doing it all, all the stitching by hand, no machines, nothing. And I went over and watched, and they had this, they had it upside down in the loom, they had it upside down stretching it out, and all you see is tangled webs, and just tangled, just everything on one side. And when they get done putting that face on and getting all that design and patterns stitched together, then they take it and put it on the heavy, the heavier felt or the heavier inside matting or what inside foam padding, whatever. And then they put the back to it, and it makes like a nice quilt. But first, all you can see is this patchwork just being designed. It looks like a tangled mess. And I'm looking at this like ripping tapestry, as it were, and it's this tangled mess. And I'm like, that's okay. I know it's going to happen. You're going to flip it over and put in the matting, sew it up. It's going to look pretty. But from that moment, looking at it, it was a tangled mass. And I was looking at it, some of this, this guy comes over, and he's there with his wife, and he's like, that looks like a tangled mess. I can pull one of those threads and help you out. <laughs> and trying to be funny about it. But he was like, I don't see the purpose of what you're doing. It's not going to look pretty after it's all said and done. Now, they started this on Thursday, and by Saturday at 4 o'clock, it was done. So these old ladies were going at it. I mean, it was pretty crazy. And um, someone asked me how sales were at the uh, the Quilt show, and I say it was so-so. But, um, I thought I'd have them in stitches, but it was okay. But I was, like, going through it, and it was, like, here they were. They're working on it, you know, over and over again. And you guys stop and say, hey, have you ever seen what the other side looks like? They said, all we have to do is just follow the pattern. All we have to do is just follow our stitch lines. Just pay attention to where we stitched over here. We can see it on the side better than the other side. We can see all what's working. And we just have to know what we're doing. We just have to pay attention to this, what we're working in the back, and it will, it will take care of itself. And then when it was all said and done, they're looking, and it was like, oh, it was the most beautiful thing. But they couldn't see it. We didn't see the finish, the finish on the other side. All we see was a tangled mess. And a lot of times we're looking at the tapestry. We're looking at our life and saying, God, are you sure you're doing right here, God? Are you, are, I just want to know you're working on it. Because right now it looks like a tangled mess. It doesn't look like you're doing anything. But when you flip that thing over and God puts it all together, it's perfect. It's settled. It's finished. And he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it. It's going to be okay. Just stay the course. But sometimes we have to ask God, God, are you working? God, give me some bit of faction that, hey, I need to know you're okay. I need to know that all things are working together for good. I need to know that you are doing something on my, on my behalf. Number five. 
we should pray when we're aching within. When we're aching within, when you're hurting. Psalms 34, 18 says, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. And he says in Psalms 145, 18, The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. When you're aching within, you have a broken heart, you're contrite. Lord, just don't understand. You need comfort. And you're aching within. I found myself this past week aching and literally can't sleep. I'm trying hard. And I'm like, why does this affect me so much? Well, it's because he's like an uncle. You know, Pastor Carpenter is like an uncle to me. Um, just he's one of my inner counselors, you know, just one of my best friends. And for him to pass away and me never, and me, first of all, not to know that he was sick, nigh unto death, I could have done something, um, major my magic wand or something. But, you know, knowing that he was sick and nigh unto death and, and I didn't know about it. And then for me to be, all I can do is just think the best. And I was, I can't tell him one last time how much he meant to me. But it's like, I'm souring for me. You know what I mean? Like he, that is... In light of eternity, he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm seeing heaven right now. I'm seeing the streets of gold. I see my Savior's face. I'm, I'm on my way to see my Savior's face. I'm sorry, Tim, but how you feel is irrelevant to me right now because I ain't taking nothing from my journey now. I'm going to heaven. I don't care. I care about your feelings, but I don't care about your feelings. And while they're, you know, like, like Paul, right? They're weeping on Paul's neck that they're going to see him no more. And Paul's just like, I'm being bound. I'm, I go bound in the spirit. I'm, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm sorry your tears are so bitter and you're hugging my neck like you're never going to see me again. And I get that, but I, I got to go. I got to go. I, watch out for the ravenous wolves. Watch out for them. Take protection. Feed the flock of God. But guys, I got to go. I got. And you can see him hold on to their ankles. No, Paul, no, go, no, go. And he's like, I got to go, go. And he's trying to keep on his, you know, look at him pension in his mind. And he's dragging along and he's just like, Got, I gotta go, I gotta go. And they're holding on to his neck and they're holding on to his feet and they're like, no, don't go, don't go. And it's like, you just, it's sorrowful. When you have that sorrow, but you know you're fixing to go. Paul said, for me to depart is, is far greater for me, but for you it's more needful that I stay back, right? Philippians 1. I'm gonna straight betwixt two. He's man, I, I need to be here for you, but oh, look what's waiting for me. I'm like, and then later on, Paul finally says, I'm ready. <laughs> Sorry, suckers. I'm gone. I see what's ahead of me. I see what's there. And he runs and he runs towards the Savior's arm. So I see that I see that with with that, but when you're aching within, you know, the sorrow that I have is right now is for myself. And it is. It's so selfish. I'm so self-centered about this that I'm like, I don't wish him back. I don't wish Jeff to come back to this earth. I don't. But I'm like, Man, I hurt inside. Part of me is dead. Part of my childhood, part of my ministry, part of my circle of influence. This burden is greater than I want, than I can bear by myself. And I'm aching within selfishly. But you know what? Regardless if it's selfishly or if it's of the other person, the fact is we're sorrowing. And God doesn't specify the sorrow and the broken spirit, whether it's selfish or, you know, not selfish like a sinfulness, but whether it's focusing on our needs or the other needs of others, God is nigh unto those that are of a broken heart and save of such as be of a contrite spirit. God is nigh unto them that call upon him, to all that call on him in truth. So where is God? God, where are you? Where are you in this time of need? Well, I'm right here with you. I'm right nigh with you. You're broken hearted, God's with you. But when you're aching within that's when we ought to turn our eyes upon the Lord. He hears our prayer. The, the sacrifices of God that can never be refused are the broken spirit and the contrite heart, right? Those are sacrifices God will never refuse. Number six. We ought to pray when we are amazed at his working. Not when we don't, not just when we don't understand God's working. When we see his working and we're like, oh, Lord God, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Right? Psalms 105. 
Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon His name. Make known His deeds among the people. Psalms 107, verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Psalms 118, 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, because His mercy endureth forever. Psalms 118, verse 29. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Psalms 136, he, he uh, quotes himself in these other verses. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Praise God, right? And by the way, when we praise the Lord, it's not just, oh, praise the Lord, out in the air, openly. Hey, praise Jesus, amen. It's actually stopping and giving him thanks. Noah gets off the ark, and he burns a peace offering and burns a, a, a offering to, to God of thanksgiving, right? How many times do we see, hey, the children of Israel cross out and get out of the wilderness and they sacrifice the Lord. They cross the Red Sea, they sacrifice the Lord. The sacrifices that God get that they, they give to the Lord as out of gratefulness, they're thinking in the Lord, great, but why don't we instead of just talking about the goodness of God, what if we actually just prayed and thanked him for the goodness that he does? Has anyone ever gotten you something really nice before? Bob, has anyone ever gotten you anything, a really cool gift before? What was it? What was the best gift you've ever gotten? Okay, but you got, you know you got it. It's like awesome, right? Ben, what about you? What was the best gift you've ever gotten? Ever received? That's better English. Oh, brown. Okay, let me ask, let me ask Aaron. Aaron, what is the best gift you've ever received? Don't see, don't see your wife. Don't see a dog. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, so you got a watch for your anniversary. Awesome, right? And you talked about it. You showed everybody the gift. You were like, this is the greatest thing in the world. This is really cool, right? Yeah. And I'm sure there was some time that you actually looked at Sarah, looked into her eyes, called upon her, looked at her face to face, and said, this is awesome. This is the most awesomest gift I've ever gotten. Thank you. How many times do we often get a gift from God? We brag about the gift from God. We give God praise to others. We testify of God's goodness. But when was the last time we actually just bowed our knees in thanksgiving to God, not towards God, and just thanking him for what he did? Getting with God and saying, God, I don't deserve this. You're so good to me. Thank you, God. Thank you for being gracious. This is the greatest thing you could have. Lord, you, you knew exactly what I needed, but just being overwhelmed at his working, just being amazed at his working. Ah, oh, Lord God, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great hand. So, movie reference, brace yourself. Joe versus all, Joe, Joe in the volcano, right? Tom Hanks is on a raft. He, find, he thinks he's dying. He thinks he's got some kind of incurable disease. And he's got to go and to sacrifice himself to the, to the volcano. And it winds up being a great big sham and whatever. Big, a great big sham? Is that what I'm looking for? Yeah. Messed up thing, lie. And he's on this raft. And he's out there heading, head, heading out towards this desert island or whatever. And he's out there in the middle of the sea. And there's the, great, there's the moon. Like, huge as can be. And on the water. And he's just looking at it. And he's just like, wow. Like, you realize, like, how self-absorbed he was and how big the you know how big other you know how little he is compared to the things that you know really matter and he's just looking at that as a picture of that anyways i remember seeing that as a kid i've never only watched the movie one time and that kind of stood out my mind and it got me thinking every time i see that i'm like how awesome it must be being out there in the middle of the ocean now you'll never catch me in the middle of the ocean but being out there in the middle of the ocean and looking out and just seeing the sunrise or the sunset and seeing a whale Seeing a great, uh, you know, a blue, a blue, a blue whale, right? Seeing something bigger than me, which kind of hard to do, but what, seeing something is bigger than that, and just watching the majesty of it, like, wow, and just wow, God made that, and it's like, and it puts you in, in, you know, puts you into significance, like I am nothing compared to God's working, but to see what God can do, this handiwork. I've never been to the Grand Canyon. It's on my bucket list. I want to go to the Grand Canyon. I'm not going to hike to the bottom, but I do want to see the Grand Canyon. And I'm just like, wow. I just want to look at it and say, wow. I remember looking at Niagara Falls and just looking at it and saying, wow, this is so cool, right? This is so awesome. Being able to see things that God has made 
and look at it and just say, that's awesome. And being amazed at his handiwork. But actually let him know, God, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. I remember when I was in high school, when I was in middle school, well, junior high, whatever it is, seventh, eighth grade, we went on a hike and I went down the Erie towpath and then we went off down this other trail and got down to where it was all undeveloped. It was just kind of marshland. Nothing was, no fence posts, nothing was there of human, of human interruption. We went back out there and there's this beautiful gurgling stream and grass around and everything. Beautiful gurgling stream, stream. A beaver dam was up there and it was just a beautiful gurgling stream going down to the beaver dam and it just stopped up. And then you could see there's a little bit of water shooting out from the, from the beaver dam, just enough to get going through. And is watching that. And then there's a little, like a little bit of a cesspool type pond and going down there and getting a stick and putting down there and reaching into getting a uh, crawdad and pulling it out and looking at the crawdad. I'm like, this is so cool. Untapped by, by mankind, except for us walking in the trail and is looking at this beautiful stream in the middle of the woods and then up ahead was a meadow and it was lush green you know grass flowing over and wildflowers and butterflies and b- birds flying around and it was just like wow like pictures couldn't describe it and I remember getting down and saying just getting alone and just saying God this is beautiful you are awesome I cannot believe this, ma- this majestic beautiful picture that I'm seeing before my eyes and it's all you God, thank you for letting me see this. It was such and something so cool. But when you are amazed at his working, and not just the creation, but just look what God is doing, and you're like, wow, God, I don't, I didn't see it before, but I see it now. Well, we're actually seeing God working, and it's like, wow, thank you, Lord, for that. Number nine, number seven, we ought to pray when we are about to wander. There's a song we sing, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love, right? It's easy for us to wander, but do you ever feel yourself starting to wander? Are you in tune with yourself to know when you're starting to wander? Flee all folk, flee all folk, wow. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Do you find yourself going towards worldly lusts? Can you catch yourself when you find yourself going towards worldly communications and worldly allurements? Or can we catch ourselves when we start going after um, those things that are just going to burn up and perish anyway in the earth? Or can we, can we catch ourselves when we're not following righteousness? When we get ourselves tied in with things that are untrue, when we get ourselves tied up with lack of love, when we are seeking more strife than peace, when we have more ought with the brethren than we ought to have, than we ought, than we should have fellowship with them, are you able to identify that and just call, talk to the Lord, and keep yourself, and keep yourself from wandering? Calling upon, you know, calling the Lord out of a pure heart. Can we do that? James 4, 7, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So submitting ourselves to God and giving our giving way to God instead of our own pleasures, giving way to the Lord when you're about to wander. Or sometimes it's after we have wandered. And we can, you know, hey, prodigal son. I'm so glad the father still takes us back. Number eight, when another is weak. When another person is weak. When a person you see around you is starting to falter. When you see a person around you is tripped up by the cares of the world. James 5.16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye might be healed, that ye may be healed. Verse 17 says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. When you see that person starting to slip, hey, maybe it's pastor. Maybe pastor's heart, he's not, he's not his heart is not backwards, but he's got a lot of things on his plate. I'm going to pray for him that ye may be healed. You want to have you healed? You want to have me healed? That ye, plural, ye may be healed. 
confessing our faults one to another, being vulnerable, praying for one another. We ought to do this when, 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 when we are weak, when, when we're weak, when we're down, when we're, when we're physically, mentally, emotionally, you know, whatever. Um, I can't think of another word, think, but you get what I'm talking about. When we're just spent, scholastically. When you're, when you're at a loss of words and you're a loss of thoughts and you just can't get in, you just, hey, they're weak, let's pray for them. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one for another that ye may be healed. Well, I don't need any prayer. I'm good. Charlie? So you're okay? You have no prayer to pray for? No, I'm good. You, you, have no per, you have no personal struggles in your life? Well, none that I want to share. Oh, okay. Confess your faults one to another. We're not like a priest telling me all your sins and you'll be absolved. It's like, hey, I've got this particular thing in my life right now, and I need prayer. I talked to a friend of mine this past week, and I was like, look, I'm having trouble with nothing that's bad. It's just not the right timing. And I'm like, I'm having trouble thinking about stuff and dealing with stuff that's not the right timing. And I need to be focused on sermon preparation and focused on things like that. And I, I'm distracted. And I need to, and I need, I would really appreciate, I covet your prayers so that I don't go off into temptation. They don't go off into error. I want to make sure I'm right. So please pray with me that I can get past this roadblock in my mind. And like, okay, we'll pray. Confessing your faults one to another is not a sign of vulnerability when you can't go to God directly. We're not asking, hey, Gabriel, pray that I can stop doing such and such. It's not. It's, it's confessing our faults one to another and praying for one another that you may be healed. Number nine, when should we pray? When is, another, when is the last season of prayer we'll get to tonight? Number nine, always and without ceasing. That doesn't mean we're supposed to close our eyes and be in a constant state of prayer and never get any work done. Hey, it's time to go, you know, it's time to cut the grass. So I'm praying. No, oh, it's not convenient. Hey, it's time to take out the trash. I remember when I was little, and I was like, okay, I went upstairs, and, and mom said, go upstairs, everybody, all you kids, go upstairs, and read your Bibles and pray and get ready for bed. That's, that's what she told us to do. Brush your teeth, go upstairs, read your Bible, pray, and get ready for bed, which we read our Bibles at nighttime. So I was upstairs reading my Bible and praying, brushing my teeth, and I'm laying in bed, and I'm, and I'm, I'm in my room, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm praying, reading my Bible, and my mom goes, Tim! Actually, she called me Timmy. Timmy! Yes, ma'am? Come down here, please. Mom, I'll be down in a minute. I need you to hold on. I'm reading my Bible. Yes, but no. <laughs> so... so <laughs> So she goes, Tim, I need you down here right now. Mom, you have to wait. I'm praying. Then fly. Timothy, David. Oh, I'm in trouble. I go downstairs. Mom, you told me to go upstairs. You told me to read my Bible. You told me to pray. I'm obeying you. This is very important. You told me to do is read my, read my Bible and praying. And now you tell me to disrupt that, to come down. I was in the middle of praying and reading my Bible. My mom sat there just frustrated because... Although, yes, she told me to do something, and I was doing it, she had me stop. And although I was reading the Bible and praying, there's nothing more that can really be done more significant than that. She still wanted me to go do something that I should have done before, but she didn't tell me to do it before. So it's all, you know, whatever. Technicality, Mom. My mom lit me up. My mom spanked my butt. Listen, my mom spanked me for reading my Bible and praying. Do you know what that does to a kid? <laughs> so don't read my Bible and don't pray. My mom said, you're getting a spanking, not for reading your Bible and not for praying. You're getting a spanking for telling me, hold on, for telling me to wait and not obeying immediately. And that's why I got spanked. That didn't make any sense. <laughs> the Bible tells me I'm supposed to pray without ceasing. Does it mean I'm never supposed to not be praying? No, we all have jobs to do. And by the way, unless you're Muslim, you don't get to pray at work five times a day on a prayer rug facing east. Okay? You don't get to do it. But always, pray always without ceasing. At work, what we can be thinking and praying at work. Yes, sing songs to the Lord. Yes, listen to preaching. Yes, listen to scripture. Yes, communicate with your coworkers. Yes, have a life. But always be in a state of prayer. Always be in an attitude and opportunity to pray. Always pray without ceasing. Say, you know what? I haven't prayed in a couple months. 
That's much to our shame. Pray without ceasing. The past few months have been my past few months have been my busiest at work. I've been busy, 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 and productive, productive, productive. But I have never taken time away from when I'm at work, being focused, to not stop and pray. And I don't have time to study and read my Bible as much as I want to read it through and read as many times as I want to read it through. Because I've got to be in the moment at work as well as in prayer. But I'm able to pray throughout. On the drive home, I'm able to concentrate and able to pray. I don't communicate with the outside world outside of my car or just me and God when I'm driving. I can spend that much time praying and thinking about what's going on. Praying for you, praying for the church, praying for direction, praying for my kids. Praying that God will do something with my kids. I mean, something drastic. To help them behave. But Lord, you've got to do something. Help me out by like being in that constant attitude of prayer. But those are seasons we ought to have in our life. To pray often. To pray always. To pray without ceasing. Without wavering. Lifting up holy hands. Keeping our lives in such a way that we don't have to question, God, are you hearing me? Because God always hears our prayer. That's what he says. And that's, a, that's what our launch verse said. I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as he hears. No, as long as I live. The Lord preserveth the simple. I love that. God knows how to deal with us. What shall I, when shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I will take the cup of salvation and will call upon the name of the Lord. Just praising him. Thanking God. Just thanking God. Do it sometime this week. Just, there's nine seasons we can look at through scripture. And if this week, if we can't stop throughout the week and think on those nine occasions, something's bad or wrong with us. If we can't stop what we're doing and take that time for prayer. I'm not talking about getting on our hands and knees and, Oh, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we beseech you this day. Be merciful to me, thy servant. I'm not saying go, go please ask like a crazy churchy, but in our own heart mind, hey, Lord, be with Daniel this week. Help him be that leader he needs to be at school. Help him be that witness. Keep his testimony pure. Help him to get good grades. Help him to finish up this year strong. Lord, help Gabriel. Just help Gabriel. <laughs> just, Lord, this is the pile of match. Lord, just help. Whatever it is it may be, Lord, give him, give him a wife. Get him married out of the house so Daniel loses less, you know, no more stress. But, the pray, but seriously, praying for one another. There's never a season where we shouldn't be praying one for another. All right, that's all I've got. Let's go ahead and ask God's blessing on our service as we close. And uh, Bob.